Traditionally, understanding of thrust belts has come from outcrop examples found on the margins of mountain belts formed by collision tectonics, but that's by no means the only place where full thrust belts are found. Some really spectacular examples, such as the one on the screen at the moment, are nothing to do with orogenic processes. These structures are driven by submarine slope failure. Massive movement downslope towards ocean basins. They form because of the interaction of sedimentation and the slopes on continental margins and the availability of spaces for sediment to accumulate on these slopes. So this presentation is a tour of a few really great examples. Let's start off with this site here, offshore Brazil. So here's a seismic profile with some faults drawn in Let's put some geology on top. Now that's not very helpful because there's a huge vertical exaggeration. So let's try and make this a bit more realistic by removing that vertical exaggeration. Here we are. It's always better to do structural geology with the vertical and horizontal scales equal. What we can see on this profile now is a thrust belt developed on the right hand side linked to a large Lystric normal fault back to the left. You can get a relationship with this by looking at the seabed, the base of the blue on there, so you can see that the thrust belt is downslope and the Lystric normal fault is linking back upslope. The idea then is the extension on the normal faults is balanced by the contraction downslope. Look at the scale, that's 35 kilometres across. So the notion may be that sedimentation back upslope near Brazil near the continent of South America on the left hand side provides a, a load and this drives down into the Atlantic on the right creating contractional structures towards the toe of the slope. This presumably is assisted by having a very weak material along the basal detachment and in general this will be provided by one of two materials overpressured mud or salt. In this particular case, we're dealing with overpressured mud. So let's jump to another example. Let's cross to the other side of the Atlantic, offshore Namibia here. And again, this is another mud-based system. So here's the seismic data. Let's add the interpretation on top. And look at the scale. That's a 25 kilometer scale bar. These are dramatic structures. Let's put a part of the Alps here at the same horizontal scale for comparison. So the thrust belt on the left hand side is an equivalent scale to the thrust belt forming on the outside of the Alps. Okay, so what about the context for the submarine system? Let's put a cross section through the continental margin here. This has got a five to one vertical exaggeration. So our submarine system is forming on a down to the ocean dipping detachment. In other words, it's sliding, the basal detachment dips oceanward. Now what sort of slopes are we dealing with here? Well that's actually the cross section on a crustal scale without vertical exaggeration. The slopes we're dealing in here are very gentle indeed. Right, so let's go and have a look at some of the structures. We can start off in the extensional domain here. Let's zoom in on that and look at the interpretation of the seismic. This has got a two to one vertical exaggeration so we can see the stratigraphic packages in these small half graben that form above Lystric normal faults, faults that are steeply dipping near surface and then curve over to become gently dipping as they tie into the basal detachment. So the various colours on here represent different stratigraphic packages that were deposited as the whole system slipped slowly off towards the floor of the Atlantic. Let's look at the thrust belt now down in here. So the top section's got significant vertical exaggeration. At the bottom we can see a profile with effectively no vertical exaggeration. A really regular set of thrust structures that stack up these sediments. There's a basal detachment. We have an imbricate system climbing off the basal detachment, stacking up the stratigraphy. It's then blanketed by a post-kinematic wedge of strata which runs back up the slope. We can zoom in on that to see the spectacular imagery with the reflectors betraying the geometry of the thrust slices. So that's gravity sliding on very gentle slopes 
but sliding isn't the only way in which sediment might be moving into ocean basins. It can also spread. So this is a seismic profile across the Niger Delta. Again, look at the scale. The scale bar is 30 kilometers. There's a huge vertical exaggeration of six to one in this profile. So it's drawn more or less correctly on the simple diagram below. It shows a prism of strata in yellow, which represents the Niger fan that's built out across the continental margin onto oceanic crust in green. It's a huge thickness of strata that flows under its own mass, rather like an ice sheet can flow. It means that towards the toe of the system, the basal detachment dips up towards the ocean. But like the gravity sliding system, we have an extensional domain upslope and a downslope thrust belt, and these link through a translational domain where the displacement from the extensional part transfers down towards the thrust belt, like this. Okay, so let's go and have a look at the thrust belt. There's some really dramatic structures in here where the sediment is ponded around the growing poles. Well, some of these structures have been imaged in three dimensions seismically, and we can use these data to understand lateral variations along a single fold thrust structure. So what we're going to do now is take one of these folds and serial section it. We're going to step through the 3D volume, slice by slice. Each one of the sections we're about to walk through is 250 meters apart, and we can use this to see how the structure changes along strike. Here we go. We'll just click through these. Mix through. You can see, first of all, at this stage, the structures that we can maybe interpret in here are directed back up slope. You can see the slope on the seabed there, from right to left. As we step along, things begin to change. This is looking a bit more symmetrical now, and a more of an upright fold, and can we begin to see perhaps that within a few of these slices, the structure's changed to be directed downslope from right to left. Here we go. Some really classic structures developing now, continuing to develop, tightening up a bit as the fold. And there we are at the end of our little tour. So that was less than 10 kilometers along the length of a fold structure. It started off directed towards the continent, that's back upslope, and finished up directed towards the ocean, that's downslope towards the left. So we can capture these variations in a few sample profiles through here. As we said, the structure when we started our tour was directed landward, we went through a portion where the structure appeared to be symmetrical with both a landward and an oceanward directed fault system within it. And then finally the system got itself organized to become entirely oceanward. It's a really neat demonstration about how the polarity of the thrust doesn't really tell us very much about the overall kinematics of the system. Everything's trying to move down slope, but sometimes the fault can be accommodated by back thrusting, which in this case is landward, and sometimes by fore thrusting, which in this case is oceanward towards the left. So we can learn a lot about thrust systems using these submarine systems. Gravity-driven fold thrust belts. They're emergent, they interact with sedimentation, which means we can look at the timing and relative activity of systems. We've seen that some systems develop by gravity sliding, others by gravity spreading. They're unified by the need to have a weak basal detachment. All our examples we've looked at in this presentation have been floored by overpressured mud, which has acted as the weak basal detachment. But other rock types, particularly salt, can play the same role. Of course, we can't go and do outcrop geology on these. We rely on seismic data, but the seismic quality is usually really excellent. Consequently, we can use images such as the one on the screen as a test bed to explore structural evolution in thrust belts. We can also try and understand how thrust systems interact with sedimentation. So they're a model area for understanding emergent systems.